was I was thinking about the content matter. Um, I was thinking about uh, the fact that if I save questions till the end, then uh, something that you have maybe halfway between. So let's say today I talk uh, a minute 20 about the state of exception. And you don't really know what I'm saying. And then you're able to ask, uh, you know, an hour later. That's not very actionable or, or useful. Uh, and so what I am I'm going to do instead, uh, I think, is break this up such that I'll, I'll speak for about 20 minutes um, and then we will talk together. And then I'll speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll talk together. And, and we'll do this for the, the hour and a half. I, I like this better um, because I, I think that the, the material here needs this, this kind of, uh, you know, this input, uh, this feedback. Does that sound good to everyone? Yeah, better. The other thing I want to talk to you about by way of talking about talking is uh, my own personal brand of cruel optimism, um, which, which hopefully you're familiar with by now, uh, which is simply this, that uh, I woke up today with a fever. I thought um, that if I you know, persisted, that the fever would uh, decline. You know, I figured that persistence and the fever would go like this. In fact, no, persistence and the fever are going like this. So what I may do today is end this half hour early, terminate at 8.20 rather than uh, 8.50. Um, if I do this, what we will do is simply add 15 minutes onto the next two lectures. Okay, there have also been some Madeus crises, um, which, which resulted, unfortunately, in a lot of you coming to class when there simply was no class. Uh, I apologize for that. I actually don't have access to Madeus, so I was able to bypass this uh, crisis entirely, um, but I'm sorry for you. Uh, what I want, wanted to do today was to discuss when the next two lectures will be, because they will not be at the regular times. This is because I am teaching in Moscow next week, uh, so I will not be here to, to give this. Uh, I think that presence is a big part of these as public lectures, and so rather than deliver something over Zoom that was or something pre-recorded, I, I figured it was better to actually move these. So the next two lectures, not courses, uh, this will be announced. Uh, the next two lectures will be on the following dates. The first one will be on the 20th, which is a Tuesday. It'll be at the same time. Okay. The next one will be on the 24th, which is a Saturday. I believe it'll be at 4. Any questions about logistics? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. So... Today's talk is called Attrition and As the Good Life, a problematic conjunction for a problematic concept. We're thinking about attrition, the wearing down of bodies as modalities of life. And we have hopefully read two readings to that end, which think about this problem, death as a modality of life, or in fact, life as a modality of death, Necropolitics by Achille and Bembe, and Berlant's Slow Death, which is chapter three of Cruel Optimism. I want to talk a bit about something different today, which is the, the state of exception. In the 1920s, the legal scholar and theorist of jurisprudence, Carl Schmitt, defined the state of exception as the sovereign's ability to transcend the rule of law when doing so was necessary to maintain public good or restore order. Again, the state of exception was defined by Schmidt as the sovereign's ability to transcend the rule of law when doing so was necessary to maintain order or restore public good. Uh, I.e., the sovereign is, is not defined here as someone who enforces law or someone who interprets regulations, like a lawyer. What defines the sovereign as opposed to the executive branch of the government, those who enforce the law, is the sovereign's ability to suspend the rule of law. A strange conjunction. What defines the sovereign's relation to law is the sovereign's ability to suspend it. If we speak in a kind of Hobbesian way of a social contract, i.e. the set of norms and laws that we all agree to and that form the infrastructure of our daily life, i.e. we do not really notice laws unless we break them and you are typically not always in violation of laws unless you are a career criminal, i.e. laws form the background of daily life, not really what you notice. Laws then are an exception and not a rule. It is an exception and not a rule to be in violation of laws for most of the population. Okay. And yet the sovereign is defined specifically as he who can violate the social contract, he who can do away with the laws. In the time of sovereignty, the time when the sovereign appears as such, the time when we actually think about sovereignty, is, according to Schmidt, an exceptional time 
because it is the time, it is the time of the suspension of laws. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the 1970s, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who people may know as a Canadian Prime Minister, um, father of current Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, appears as sovereign when he declares martial law. When the citizens of Canada no longer have the right to a fair trial, no longer have the right to be charged before being held in prison, and so forth, that's when Pierre Elliott Trudeau appears as sovereign, not when he's interpreting laws, not when he's doling out fair trials, and so forth. The state of exception here is not just an exceptional time where our usual strategies of coping with or thriving in the world no longer work. It is also legible as such. We have a decision or a declaration after which there is a state of exception. We have a decision or declaration after which there is a state of exception. To put this in colloquial language, we certainly know when there is a state of emergency, it is declared, it looks nothing like our daily life. This is the logic of Schmidt in the 1920s. When rights are restored, unrest is quelled, order prevails, we have another de declaration, which is a declaration that the state of exception is over. So it's bookended by two declarations. We have a declaration of martial law, which is a declaration that you can no longer expect the kind of affordances and rights of a citizen that you have usually expected for, what, 20 years of your life, if a state of exception is declared. And you have another declaration, which is that order has been restored, unrest has been quelled, and that you can again expect these rights, rights to a fair trial, rights to, um, for example, uh, being charged before being held in prison indefinitely, and so forth. Okay. Articulated with the state of exception is a right to violence. A right to violence. Violence which is also exceptional because it stands in for the rule of law. I.e., law is the exercise of violence based on the interpretation of rules and their violation. We understand this, right? That if you violate a certain amount of rules, you will go to prison. This is an exercise of violence. If we think about countries that have the death penalty, this is an obvious exercise of violence on the basis of violation of laws. I.e., if you violate these laws, you can expect that this will happen. The violence of the state of exception is something else something else. It is violence that stands in for the normal process of legislation and execution. I.e. here, in the state of exception, violence does not follow from the rule. Violence sets the rule. The emergence of executive orders in real time, as opposed to the creation of legislation for, through democratic means and debate, for example, and its enforcement by a separate branch of government, expresses the temporal dimension of this foundational violence. The emergence of executive orders in real time expresses the temporal dimension of this foundational violence, i.e. these rules are not up for debate, not up for grabs, and there is no temporal discretion between their declaration and their enforcement, i.e. when the rules are declared in a state of exception, they immediately go into effect. We are asking a, a simple question today. Um, and it's simple because it's easy to ask, not simple because it's easy to answer. Unfortunately, none of these are, are easy answers or there wouldn't be a lecture. I would simply write two sentences on the board and then I would leave you and, and go nurse myself. If violence is traditionally seen as an interruption of the normal state of things, one breaks the law, etc. What happens when violence is articulated as a modality of life itself? I'll ask that again. If violence is seen as an interruption of the normal state of things, either because you have violated a law or because, in fact, you can't count on laws at all because the state of exception has been declared, what happens when violence is articulated as a modality of life itself? This will push us beyond the state of exception, where violence is certainly the rule, but where it can only become this because the state of exception will end. Violence can be the rule in the state of exception because the state of exception will end. The before and after of the sovereign's choice is only palatable to us because of that discretion, i.e. the fact that it starts and stops. And that discretion should bring another whereby the state of exception ends. In other words, we accept as citizens a state of exception, a declaration of martial law. Why? because this is exceptional, because we do not assume that things will go on like this forever. 
you would have a crisis of faith in your government, the government would lose legitimacy, or you would have a protracted civil war if you believe that the state of exception would go on forever. Or you would have an entirely new equilibrium, i.e. your democracy would form around a dictatorship if the state of exception were to become the rule. Okay. Another way to say the same thing. If the state of exception presupposes that the very violence it unleashes won't be enough to destroy the conditions on which normal life can be called into being again. So the assumption here is that the violence unleashed by the state of exception will not be a violence extreme enough to destroy the conditions on which normal life can be called into being again. We can imagine an end to the state of exception, and we assume that the violence unleashed by the state of exception will not attenuate that end, will not stop us from realizing that eventually. In other words, if the executive, executive orders are too ruthless, you don't again have trust in your government, or the state of exception becomes, once again, a protracted civil war. You're not able to call order again. And we assume that the violence of the state of exception will not stop us from being able to call order again at one point. What happens then when this is not the case? That's what we're asking today in Achille and Bembe's Necropolitics and Lauren Berlant's Slow Death. What happens when this is not the case, when those who have called the state of exception undermine their own ability to call it off? That's the big question for today. Can this profit the state? Does it always have to harm it? Is this always a crisis of legitimacy for the state, or can this actually be a mode of governance? Who has called the state of exception in Achille and Bembe's work, or Lauren Berlant's work? When will it end? How could we imagine it ending? I would like to look at a scene, and I would like to think about it in terms of the state of exception that we've just talked about, and the tools that we've looked at in, in Berlant and in Bembe. I want to think about this according to necropolitics and slow death. It's a domestic scene. It's not an exceptional scene. And yet I think you'll see why I'm talking about it in terms of the state of exception. So again, the idea here is that I have presented what's probably a tricky concept. We're going to look at a scene, we're going to op this, open this up to questions, and then we're going to talk again. So what I would like to do, um, well, what I would have liked to do is ground this in something. Um, ground this, in fact, in a, a clip from Invanda's room. We'll start with this tomorrow. Instead, I'm confident I can play this from my um, computer, even though I can't play it from this. So what I would like to do then is open this up to questions on the state of exception. I presented you with a hard concept. I grounded it in the work of Carl Schmitt. We've talked about it as a suspension of the rule of law, something that gets its value not from the deciding of laws, not from their execution, but in fact from throwing all that out. And we've talked about potential problems with that, i.e. that that suspension does not necessarily imply that order will be restored in itself. Do we have questions in the state of exception? Yeah, it's uh, maybe a clarification question about the state of exception, because it seems there might be different, in, like in different scale, because for example, a war, it's really a state of emergency, really state of exception, or pandemic as, as well. And what we have now, for example, uh, um, the climate crisis, for example, it's more protracted and long in time. So, the, the, what state of exception we are talking about? Like, so we're given two analytics uh, from our readings this week. We're given the state of exception on the one hand and the state of siege on the other. One is a domestic analytic. One lets us analyze the kind of uh, population at home, right? And the other one, the state of siege, is supposed to analyze what? If something is in a state of siege, probably, and, and we are in fact the ones executing the state of siege, is it our home? Is it our country? Probably not, right? The state of siege applies to geopolitics, yeah? So that if we're thinking about a state of siege, we're thinking about a state of exception brought to another country. Have we done the... the I guess I'm a bit surprised at the... Uh, um, 
I won't ask this because uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. But um, ideally, uh, what happens for these is that we do the readings beforehand for um, for Tuesday. Um, these will make a lot more sense with the, the readings because what I'm going to do is do a reading of the readings. Um, on Wednesday and Friday, typically what I will do is an explanation of the readings, but this is based on actually uh, having read these things. Okay. So we have a state of exception and we have a state of siege. A state of exception applies to a domestic population. That is, a state of exception makes sense because we understand the inner contours of the laws, the regulations that inform daily life, that are the infrastructure for daily life, the domestic population. A state of siege has the same object. A state of siege has the same object. I, what do we want to do if we want to bring about a state of siege and we are a sovereign? Any thoughts? We want to make daily life very hard for a certain population. We want to make daily life very hard for a certain population. So that a state of siege, in as much as it describes a kind of war, is about cutting off the infrastructure of a population, i.e. Uh, the, exa the examples for this week were, um, for example, destroying crops, destroying highways, um, kind of corralling or cutting off information technologies. Are we distinguishing in a state of siege between civilians, between those who are living their daily life, between enemy combatants? Not really, no. Right? So that in the state of siege, what we are suspending is precisely the distinction between the enemy and the civilian, the combatant and the non-combatant, right? Now, what this forces us to ask then, if we're cutting off infrastructure, if we can describe actually quite easily what a state of siege is, what happens to our concept of the enemy? As such. If the enemy is in fact a concept that validates just war, and we see this in Mbembe, right, that we go to war because we have an enemy, a clear enemy, and the state of siege, i.e. tactics for this war, are precisely about effacing the distinction between the enemy and the civilian, then what validates this enterprise? What allows it to continue? Okay. Now the state of siege, like the state of exception, is supposed to be temporally discrete. What characterizes the state of exception? It is called at a certain time. It suspends the rule of law. And in suspending the rule of law, we have what? Executive orders in real time. Why is the state of exception tenable? I.e., why can uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau call martial law? Because of the belief that the state of exception will end i.e. order will be restored, we will in fact have uh, the right to a fair trial and the right to be sentenced before being held in prison and so forth, right? Okay, state of siege, similar. You do what? Well, in a state of siege, you batter the enemy into submission. Once submission is achieved, that enemy either becomes a kind of supplicant state, right? Uh, becomes a colony. Or something like this, right? And then what stops? Well, the state of siege stops. So the state of siege is also supposed to be temporally discrete. But Mbembe says something different. Mbembe says something different, which is that the state of siege, which is coextensive with Schmidt's writing on the state of exception, the state of siege today acquires what he says, what he calls a permanent spatial arrangement. A permanent spatial arrangement. What do we think that means? Can you say a bit more? So it becomes a part of ordinary life, certainly, and why? Well, uh, it becomes uh, an ordinary life because um, by some means um, it is made permanent, like uh, uh, the me particular medium is used in order to uh, make it permanent. So it becomes permanent because it stops being a temporally discrete phenomenon and acquires instead a spatial arrangement, right? A spatial arrangement. What example does Mbembe give of this? The colony, 
Yeah. So what I would like to do, um, praying to the God of false positives that we, we can uh, actually look at two clips, um, is, is look uh, at a film uh, by uh, Gilles Ponte Corvo called The Battle of Algiers, where we see the spatialization of the state of siege. I think we can see quite literally how this require, acquires a permanent spatial arrangement. What I want to ask then is what happens to political agency if the state of siege is no longer an exception, is no longer a temporally discrete phenomena, but acquires a permanent spatial arrangement. So we'll look at one clip, we'll talk a bit about what's going on, hopefully, um, and then we'll look at another one, hopefully, and do the same. Okay? So this is uh, French-occupied Algeria. Ponte Corvo is a politicized filmmaker. Clearly what he wants to represent here is the occupation in some ways. What are his strategies for representing this? And how do we think this fares with our definition of the state of siege as a permanent spatial arrangement? He has a few different strategies for representing this, right? That we've just seen. What I can tell, I see in two different situations. At first, it was violence. So the soldiers were really aggressive, treating people really badly. And the second one, they were sharing, they were sharing food, they were trying to take attention and maybe validate themselves for their actions with sharing some food. So what I can tell that there are going to be two or maybe more ways of how we can make it work. Basically, it's going to be violence and it's going to be like some kind of kindness, some kind of sharing. That's very interesting, right? We have a kind of schizoid relation here. We have 10 seconds of violence, breaking down doors, arresting people. And we have 10 seconds of handing out bread, a parade. Other thoughts on these representational strategies? Is it effective to simply show violence? We're showing soldiers misbehaving, certainly, right? Soldiers punishing children, civilians, and so forth. Is that effective as a political strategy? And if so, what does it do? David, can I ask a question actually before? Like, so um, was it like two different scenarios or was it one continuous uh, act? So firstly, they uh, violated uh, the city and then they shared, um, like marched with all this spread and stuff. So here what we watched was a single episode that happened on the 5th of February. Um, there was violence uh, and there's handing out bread and these can uh, be thought as something that happened successively or simultaneously. They both happen on the 5th of February, certainly. So for the people that are subject to the violence and subject to the, the kind of cultural imposition, the parade and the bread and so forth, right? It's probably not a lot of space between the violence and the handing out of bread, right? certainly not enough space to effectively become uh, reoriented, right? To become in a different kind of effective state. Certainly not enough space to forget about the violence, right? So clearly there's a political filmmaker here and he wants to show violence. And so he shows soldiers misbehaving, persecuting children, so forth, breaking down businesses. What's the effect of that for you? Yeah, um, this is a, a political film and a politicized filmmaker. And one of the strategies is revelation, right? He wants to show soldiers misbehaving, violating the rule of law, violating colonial order. So we have soldiers breaking down businesses. We have soldiers persecuting children. We have soldiers misbehaving, <laughs> generally speaking, right? And the strategy is, of course, to put that on screen, that it means something, in fact, to represent that, right? And I'm asking what the effects of that are and how we relate that to Mbembe's claim that the state of siege has a permanent spatial arrangement. Is this effective in representing a permanent spatial arrangement? You think so? In the way he, in the way the director showed us the whole picture, uh, we can tell that there is a special arrangement for sure because what we saw, at, what we've seen at first was really. I would like to say that I did understand why they did it, but um, what I can tell that, <clears throat> sorry, 
but I can tell that uh, in the way he showed us the violence itself, um, we started to use our own associations with violence. We started to think more deep about this and we started to uh, picture more other things which could happen to these people. And after this, like, as you said, maybe in five seconds later, they've been sharing food, which I don't know, didn't look real for me. So what he tried to show us that, yeah, they were aggressive, but they decided to use their fake sharing. Their, they, they, they decided to make people believe that they were fine and nice, but in a way it wasn't like that. That's a very interesting point, please. Oh, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the second episode was interesting moment when a um, soldier uh, tried to give a food uh, to a woman uh, and uh, she, she didn't accept it and she just uh come came away uh, gone away went, uh from his uh from him uh, and it's it was kind of interesting because uh this moment show showed that uh, they remember about the violence and they um uh, uh, they wasn't wasn't ready to um accept the help because it's not help it's just uh, something uh, that uh, should uh, make them uh, more i don't know less aggressive toward uh, soldiers i think that's very interesting right there's a kind of politics of refusal here which is clearly related to the memory of the film we have just seen this violence uh, i believe we have Two or three. I thought I saw Snijana's hand, but uh, we'll go Margarita. And then, do you want to a second? Nice. Well, actually, I saw the good and bad cop strategy here. So, firstly, they were like aggressive, uh, maybe uh, to make people understand that it is not like they are not in a good um, state right now. Then <clears throat> they make this uh, gesture of kindness, sharing um, to maybe uh, like make it a little bit uh, not so uh, strong. I don't know. So yeah. Thank you. I don't know. As for me, in Isaac, in Isaac case, I cannot see like. Previous points were about the second, second scene when like uh, the movement rejected the food. So because they oppressed them before, because of that she rejects the food. But I, I believe the reason because of that. I believe that actually it's because of this occupation. It's because people, other people, came to them not bef um, because they previously uh, somehow. Um, pressured them but because they are in their space and like it's already happened before not in the this particular scene thank you maybe one more thought and then talk a little bit of carl's thieves please uh i think that the fact that there is violence first and then sharing of food it points us to uh, the thought that actually v constant violence is not sustainable for colonizers and we cannot just use violence all the time and if we want to keep this country under siege if we want to uh, if the state of siege is to progress then we should make something sustainable something livable so the conditions uh, are livable very interesting right that oh please please Ashma. yeah i just want to add one more thing um about the scene with the 
soldiers breaking stuff, whatever. Yeah, and in connection to the permanent spatial arrangement, I think it's very clear here because, as said in the reading, it's when bare life is most clearly seized by state. And we see this un un unity in the power of the soldiers and the bare life, for example, them telling uh, just these normal people to open up their shops. These are their life in the ordinary, their ordinary lives being broken down by this power. So in a sense, we see this permanent spatial arrangement by this unity that we see happening. Thank you, Najma. That's great. So um, for those who uh, uh, need a refresher on bare life, this concept is used to describe the fact that in certain, again, permanent spatial arrangements, which we call states of siege, bare life is life that is first encountered as fungible. I.e., what do we see of this life? Not culture first, not, in fact, you don't see, for example, the various foods that are created. Um, you don't see really much of these people at all. What do you see? Their fungibility, their vulnerability to violence, their need for food, and so forth. This is what Mbembe is talking about when he's talking about bare life. Okay, I have a, a really simple question on the surface. Uh, that, that I hope will allow us to think synthetically across the great points that, that have been made so far, which is this. Where does the bread come from? Where does the bread in Algeria come from that the soldiers are handing out? If, for example, it was, um, yeah, please. Well, I get the impression that soldiers, they, at the, I get the impression that uh, soldiers at first place took the bread from the Algerians and then uh, give the, this Algerian bread to Algerians back as a handout. There is a deep irony here, right? Which is that the Algerian bread comes from Algeria. That sounds like a tautology, I'm saying Algeria twice, but it's actually not, right? We have a kind of constitutive and original appropriation, an appropriation of food, yes? And what do we have after that? The handing out of food as a condition of continuing to live. It's not about, in fact, oh, we finally found food and we can end the state of siege. The state of siege is the condition for the appropriation of this food in the first place. It's the reason the soldiers have the food. It's the reason they can then hand out the food. So that their act of handing out the food is not opposed to, as in a binary, it's not opposed to the state of siege. It's not about ending it. It's in fact the fruit of the state of siege. Do we see what I'm saying? It's the fruit of the state of siege. It presupposes it. Okay, so this is part of what Mbembe means when he says the state of siege requires a permanent spatial arrangement, is that the state of siege becomes an infrastructure for continuing to live even as, and precisely because it does what? Threatens life, right? The state of siege is about creating all of these choke points where the resources that you could have presupposed in your daily life are no longer things you can presuppose. What does the permanent state of siege or the state of siege that requires, acquires a permanent spatial arrangement do? Appropriates these resources and redistributes them, right? This is why colonial occupation works. If you are just starving your people, well, what's going to happen? You're going to run out of people to, in fact, colonize, right? If it is completely unsustainable, if this modality of occupation is not also a modality of life, it simply does not work. This is what Mbembe means when he says that what should be, in the 1920s, a temporal concept acquires a permanent spatial arrangement. Okay. So what I would like to think about now, oh, by the way, I should ask, is that a clear idea? Is that a clear idea? That what should be something that is finite temporally acquires a permanent spatial arrangement. Why? Because it becomes an infrastructure for continuing to live on. Continuing to live on. That bread will, in fact, be accepted eventually if the conditions of life are so curtailed that one cannot produce bread on their own. Okay. So then... The next question, and it's a big one, and, and I'm sorry, uh, I think the, the fever is kind of waning. Uh, so what we will do is we'll talk about one more clip, and then uh, we'll think about this uh, tomorrow and on Friday. Um, the next question is this. What happens if this is in fact the condition of life for these subjects, right? Does this simply 
right over political agency in general? Is there any possibility of resistance other than refusal and death? That's going to be the question. And what I would like you to pay particular attention to is the temporal dimension here. What is the strategy of political resistance? What is its relationship to daily life? Does it try and create a state of exception of its own? If so, how does it do it? So all of the strategies we've talked about thus far are going to be employed in this scene. They're going to be employed in a kind of counter-political way. I'd like to think about the effects of that. I'd like to think about what's going on in this scene. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's just the other clip that I have lined up. This one I have faith in as well. Yes. Okay, so first question, will this make it on the UTMN website? Open question. Um, what I would like to think about here are three moments. I want to think about how they use this economy of spectacle, how they, use, how they kind of oscillate between, on the one hand, spectacle, and on the other hand, this idea of passing, i.e. the sense that nothing should appear as out of the ordinary, that nothing should change. So what do we make of this scene and its moments? How do we start this scene? Controversially. What begins the scene? They're veiled, yes. And what do they do? Okay, so they're making hair and uh, dressing the, to make uh, them look like uh, fancy girls, yes. Well, not fancy per se, but what? What particular? Well, um, to be like a uh, true like uh, citizen, like um, kind of uh, responsible citizen or something like that. And what is the image of a responsible citizen in uh, colonial Algiers? Colonial Algiers. No, it's not a trap by, at all. It's, it's what? Uh, what language does a responsible citizen speak in colonial well, Algiers? French. French, right? You speak French, you pass as a French woman, probably. Yeah, and if, and if you don't pass as a French woman, what's the second best thing? That you are at least attempting to, to be French, to be French, right? So that we start this scene with a kind of spectacle. Why is it a spectacle? Because we have seen these women in this movie as veiled for the entirety of the movie. And Pontecorvo is suggesting here that the action of this, a kind of political response, starts with what? Starts with a kind of problematic spectacle of unveiling, right? That they must unveil, that they must cut their hair, they must speak French, you know? What's the second part of this scene? So there's three, if we were to just kind of timeline this, it would be very easy to do so, right? We would have a, a first moment in which uh, the women cut their hair, take off their veils. We'd have a second moment in which what happens? Sorry? That's true, okay. So I guess there may be four moments in this scene, <laughs> not three. The second, let's, let's say it this way. Um, if this is about, if you believe me, a, a kind of a dialectic that is an oscillation between, on the one hand, a desire for revelation or spectacle, and on the other hand, a desire that there is no interruption whatsoever, that daily life continues to look like daily life, right? What would the second part of this be? We start with the spectacle, unveiling this kind of scopophilic desire, that is, scopophilic, uh, the desire to see, right? The desire not just to see, but to see beyond the veil, is satisfied by Pontecorvo. And he's suggesting that this is political. It's very problematic. Okay, the second part isn't, in fact, about spectacle. It's not about seeing, it's about what? It's about fitting in and uh, passing, passing as French. Precisely. So the drama of the second part of this scene is, is what? That, you, that you'll fail to pass, right? That you'll fail to pass. Which means that if everything goes well, 
daily life is not interrupted. This permanent spatial arrangement is in fact satisfied, and what does one do? Well, one tries to uh, become, one tries to fall on the winning end of that, right? One tries to appear as a colonizer, or at least as a well-adjusted colonized subject, and not in fact as one of the objects of oppression, the objects of siege, yeah? There's a third moment, of course, which is the, the kind of narrative payoff. If we think about this as a, a sort of linear narrative that builds tension, the last moment does what? Gives us a kind of release, right? You see an explosion. You're expecting it the whole time. Your expectations are gratified. What did that explosion do for people? Open question, how did you receive that? I can ask a more specific question too, which is, what do you think is being suggested about political agency here? There's a kind of tripartite movement, which is a threefold movement, right? On the one hand, there's a spectacle. On the other hand, a face in a spectacle in order to, what, create an even bigger spectacle, yeah? Why is Ponte Corvo playing with spectacle here? If the state of siege is what should be a kind of state of exception that requires a permanent spatial arrangement, if the state of siege, the war state of exception that requires a per, acquires a permanent spatial arrangement, what is Ponte Corvo suggesting about political agency here or political resistance? What does one do in order to resist? in Ponte Corvo's film. Please. I think that one of his messages was that uh, violence leads to violence, basically because, yeah, people have been under, under arrest, people have been pressed, people have been selected by fitting in or not fitting in in the new kind of country which they had. And in the end, what we can see their exposure, as you said, uh, is the way of showing their protest but at the same time, which is a big event, of, I'm sorry, um, a big, how do I say that? I'm sorry. Um, a, a really aggressive way and harmful way for the society because we could see that in this place that there were a bunch of people, like kids and any other, any other people were there. And I feel like that the main message was he trying to say that violence leads to violence and it's kind of like a circle you know like a cycle certainly inarguably right that we have this idea that there is a, a kind of violence of colonial occupation and what do we do to respond to that we respond with violence so there is in a sense a continuum of violence and we have to take that very seriously right is the violence represented in the same way we, so we've seen two scenes of violence, right? We've seen a kind of uh, we've seen these explosions which don't discriminate, right? And we've also seen these soldiers lashing out at a variety of different people. They also don't discriminate. So in this way, they are similar. Are there any differences, Margarita? Mm, I believe there are differences. I mean. Firstly, when we see the act of violence, it was explicit violence, like they didn't try to hide themselves or somehow fit in the environment, they just come and occupy the environment. But here we see as this woman, this woman, they, they first of all try to feed, then they try to uh, lay these bombs and only then it shows itself, like they shoot. Hide them, Sorry. They should hide themselves to to provide the world with this violence. They cannot make it explicitly. Other thoughts? Yeah, I also believe that uh, there were different goals of for this violence. First one is was like uh, the soldiers uh, made violence to like to made it just 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 to show people that they are oppressed, show their power. Uh, but in the second case, uh, women, it, it was just like an act of protection to show that they're not going to, they're they going to fight back. And then they're not going to be just like the victims of this uh, violence. 
I want to dwell on this just for one second and then I'll hear from other people as well. Um, so we have an interesting question here about violence and its, and its relationship to instrumentality, right? That typically when we're talking about violence, violence is means to an end. And we ask questions like, well, does the end justify the means, right? And this is the, the sort of ethical compass with which we're used to colloquially talking about violence. Here we have two different relations, it seems. We have on the one hand soldiers who are committing violence in order to what? Probably um, create a kind of submissive population in which they no longer need to rule by violence, in which they can rule by fiat, usually. So if we think about um, the formation of states, um, and we'll see this uh, in fact in a week, if we think about the formation of states and we read someone like Walter Benjamin, all states have a kind of foundational violence which is the beginning of the state. And yet today, when you think of your interactions with the state, probably you don't think about them in terms of violence because the state no longer needs to rule with violence. The state rules with laws, the state gives you things. Um, it's, it's a split between prohibition and patronage, right? That violence typically doesn't enter into it unless in fact you have grievously violated some kind of law. Okay, so that today we think about violence as a kind of means to an end in which there no longer needs to be violence. This could be how we describe the soldiers, that the soldiers appropriate the food, which is violent, in order to what? Create a series of, or a population of supplicants, i.e. population that is dependent on them, who they no longer need to um, rule with a stick because they can rule with what? A carrot, yeah? Okay, does the violence of the women, it's certainly violence, right? There's explosions, kills, uh, doesn't discriminate between uh, children, men, women, etc. Right? Does the violence of the women have this kind of end? Does it want to create a supplicant population? Does it want to create a situation in which there is, or does it seem to point to a situation in which there will no longer be violence? What becomes the point of blowing something up? Seems that the point is to blow more things up to kind of set off a series of this like terrorist attacks and to make uh, the population more active, I think. So w when we're calling something terroristic, certainly there's a, there's a proselytizing dimension to it. You, maybe it incites other people to take similar actions, right? Not always, though. When we want to call something terroristic, what are we pointing out? What separates regular violence or criminal violence from an act of terrorism? Okay, uh, probably, probably I'm completely wrong, but I will try. I, I will, I will give it a shot. Um, it seemed to me it was uh, very attentively that uh, there were three aims of explosion. Okay. There were th three places, three different places. One is the bar, uh, and second is the restaurant, and third I don't remember, but it's not important. The main thing is that in the bar, for example, it was attentively shown that there are many people of the of that country, not French or Algerian. No, isn't isn't I'm, isn't I'm right? There there weren't at, at least the Algerians that were in the bar were French speaking Algerians. Yeah. Yes, but uh, they are still Algerians, and it seems to me, uh, firstly, that terroristic attack is characterized by the aim to make a fear. Uh, the main goal of terrorism is to make fear and to make a destabilization in, for example, in a region and make, for example, a, a power, a political power, uh, now it's French, uh, to be fearful and to understand that this uh, thing uh, can, uh, can, can start at any moment by, by a knock. And uh, the second uh, aim of this fear was uh, to make fear in Algerians, like they, like, People don't go away. Don't uh, don't watch in these political powers the real power because you are still in danger. And if you, so to say, betray your country, you will be punished. I see these two uh, aims of these actions, and uh, this violence will not lead to the end of violence because it will be more and more blasts. That's a very good way into this. Okay, so when we talk about terrorism etymologically, very clearly, we have the word terror, right? Terrorism. We are talking about an affect, certainly. 
Um, but I think we can say a bit more about this. So if we talked about the state of siege, and this is very, by the way, uh, I should say that, you know, you started with a caveat, maybe this is wrong. Uh, I know you have pointed us uh, very much in a good direction, so thank you. Um, when we talk about uh, terror, we can talk about it as an affect, of course, like, this is one can feel terror, um, but terror is primarily a problem of proprioception. Proprioception in colloquial language just means the way in which I orientate myself towards my environment. So for example, if I come into this room and I've never been in this room before, I acclimatize, maybe I'm aware of my body, maybe I'm aware of my surroundings, etc. The seventh time I come into this room, I immediately go for the chair, I know full well what I want, I'm comfortable in this room, I understand my surroundings, okay? So when we inject terror into an otherwise domestic scene, we can assume that these people are regulars at this bar. We can assume that these people have been on a, at a train station before. We can assume, assume that these people have been to a shopping mall before, right? These are scenes of daily life. When we inject terror into a scene of daily life, what are we doing? We're posing a question, a question of proprioception. We're trying to create a situation in which one's habitual relations to this daily scene are what? anything but habitual, right? After an explosion, are you going to order another drink at the bar? <laughs> of course not, right? You're not going to. Are you going to continue to you know, buy that jacket you were looking at? Probably not, right? Um, so these are primarily assaults on daily life. This is what we mean when we're talking about terror. It's not just about making a population scared. It's an act of estrangement. It's about posing the question of habituation to one's daily surroundings and making that an open question, i.e. making the population unsure how they will continue to live that life as daily life. And it does this via something quite obvious uh, that the cinema is very good at, which is spectacle, right? It does this via the transmission of spectacle. So that Ponte Corvo's answer to this question of the state of siege acquiring a permanent spatial arrangement, he sees this as a problem of visibility i.e. if you accept the food of the soldier, and if that food of the soldier becomes not a condition of stopping you from living, but becomes daily life for you, then Ponte Corvo's answer to that is to re-inject spectacle into daily life. Do you see what I'm saying? To re-inject spectacle into daily life. He sees this not just as an aesthetic strategy, I, it's not simply that he's trying to motivate, let's say, uh, you know, a global audience who sees this film to sympathize with the plight of the Algerians and maybe do something. That's probably secondary, right? He doesn't believe that no one is aware of the colonial occupation of Algiers and that his film is going to finally uh, spread this information globally. That would be a kind of very naive documentarian approach. This is not a documentary film. It's a narrative film, right? And so what he's doing is using something that's very specific to narrative i.e. this oscillation between a kind of sequence of events that has to go in a certain order and should not all be spectacular, and spectacle, i.e. those things that narrative finally arrives at that are these wow moments where you actually pause them. I can give you a good example of this. Um, I'm sure you've all seen like uh, Transformers or Avengers or, or things like this, yeah, American exports to, to Russia, yes? Yeah. Thor, I don't, I don't know, I could, I could probably find more examples. What I find very interesting about these is that they struggle with precisely this narrative economy that Ponte Corvo has mastered. Why do they struggle with it? Because they want every single scene to be a scene of spectacle. That is, um, you know, you go from uh, this impossible gunfight to someone falling off a skyscraper to half of Earth being blown up, and then that's not enough, and so five other galaxies are blown up. The maximalism belies a kind of problem, namely that if you only use spectacle, what happens to it? It becomes kind of boring after a while. I, in other, maybe, it's, maybe it's just me, but in fact, uh, I am never more bored than when I'm watching a three-hour action film. Um, I could watch a three-hour film where nothing happens and, in fact, find more to see and more to pay attention to. So this problem of spectacle and its relationship to narrative is one that Ponte Corvo knows well and that we've kind of forgotten today. So um, I did say I was going to end a bit earlier, but I wanted to hear from other people before I did that. Do we see this point? Do we see not only the kind of state of siege acquiring a permanent spatial arrangement, but at least one political answer to this, which is to 
reinject spectacle, yeah? So we see that. My question, um, and, and this can be kind of twofold. One, it can be, how do you feel about this? But two, it could be, what are the problems with this? So if we see that strategy, my question is simply, does it work? Does it work for you? We've already talked about one problem with it, which is that it seems, in fact, even though it grabs our attention, even though it interrupts daily life, it seems to presuppose a continuum of violence, right? Not habituation, not, in fact, decolonial movements at all, but a continuum of violence it seems to presuppose that. There are some other issues with it, too. Any thoughts? Or were you compelled by this scene? Is a kind of political act? Did I see a hand or a stretch? Stretch. Take a second to think about this question. It's twofold, right? On the one hand, I, I want to know what are the problems with this, if any, right? Um, does this succeed, in fact, encountering the state of siege as something that has acquired a permanent spatial arrangement? If not, then why? And then the second part of this is just that if this is clearly predicated on spectacle, yeah, re-injecting spectacle into daily life, and if in my Transformers example, too much spectacle actually leads to what? A lack of attention. Do we see a similar problem here? Nikolai, please. I'm trying to, uh, I'll try to uh, bring up what I think about it. So, uh, answering the first question, does it, uh, what problems does it have with the state of Saich? Uh, I say that it would not be enough. So, uh, I think there should be like this, um, middle ground between uh, not enough action, so maybe uh, if it's uh, only a uh, um, singular explosion, it might not affect, so uh, like the situation is going to get worse, people will get more checked, and so on and so forth, so things only get worse. But uh, if explosions uh, became the, uh, the daily life, the ordinary life, uh, it is also probably mm, would not affect because people will just get used to something is blowing up every day. Uh, so maybe in order to fight, uh, the um, people who want to fight back need to find uh, this, this middle ground, this uh, position where they can um, act, um, how would I say it, um, exposedly enough but not too much. So yeah. You bring up a really interesting point, right? That what we are being asked to think about here is a kind of compression of two different types of violence. The one spectacular, but primarily individual, or, or at least conspiratorial, you know, you have a group of people who do this. And the other infrastructural, right? Which is that it's part of the occupying power, part of the fabric of daily life. How does one address the other when they have in fact two entirely different registers? They're opposites. Again, what do we do if we're effective? Well, we interrupt daily life. When would the bomb fail if it fails to actually injure anyone and doesn't do much, yeah? So we see these, one has value, not in terms of it's addressing the other, but in terms of being the antithesis of the other, right? One has value as the antithesis of the other. The bomb has value as the antithesis of the usual procession of daily life. And yet, what are we asked to think about? One as a response to the other, a kind of call and response. I have a question, um, which is that, so can we think of analogs today in which there are strategies like this and they escape global attention? Um, one good example, um, maybe you, I don't, I don't know how many people watch the news or are too depressed to, to do so, um, but one good example would be this. Uh, you know, uh, every other week, um, Hamas sends rockets in response to some, uh, you know, violence uh, on behalf of Israel into Israel, into Israel, right? And these rockets are usually intercepted, but of course they are explosions, right? Do we see these in the news usually? Not usually, right? This, if this happens uh, every other week, do it, does it become a news event every other week? Are we always talking about Palestine? 
Certainly not today, right? So that these strategies of spectacle don't always do what we want them to do. In fact, sometimes can also be included within daily life itself. This is what we're going to think about the next two days. And by next two days, I mean on uh, Wednesday and Friday. We're going to think about how these modalities, which should be spectacular, which are decidedly modalities of death, you are blowing things up, yeah? Become, in fact, allowable exceptions in the otherwise normal procession of things. Become allowable exceptions in the otherwise normal procession of things to the degree that they don't even appear in the news. See what I'm saying? Okay. So, uh, you know, actually, uh, we didn't we didn't end so early after all. I, I wanted to just give the floor to you for any final questions. We have a couple minutes left. Um, these could be cumulative. What are you saying when you're saying state of exception? What is the state of siege? Why did you show us this Ponte Corvo film? Or they, or they can be more specific, uh, and certainly they can be uh, comments on what we've seen or talked about. Does anyone have any concluding thoughts? Okay. Well, in that case, I shall let you go. Um, we will make up these seven minutes between the next two lectures because I do need to, to go home and rest. But I thank you all for your attention and patience today. Um, I believe that by week three, we'll successfully see images when we're trying to see images. Yes. Thank you all.